Anybody who talks against the government has become anti-national. You can't oppose. You can't speak. So I think their democracy is very questionable state right now, and it's going to be much more worse in the coming stages if we don't, you know, mobilize people. Religion always can create a big divide. It can divide as much as it can unite. You have this nationalist right, which defines nationalism as hatred for the enemy, which defines nationalism as hatred for the Muslim, which defines nationalism as hatred for the Dalit, which defines nationalism as hatred. We are living in times where we are looking up to leaders who reflect division and bigotry and hatred. And we are choosing those people. Every democracy has three institutions that must remain independent. The media, education, and the judiciary system. In India today, this is not the case. After the BJP came into power in 2014, freedom of dissent in all forms has increasingly been silenced. Police is now claiming a big breakthrough in the murder of senior journalist Gauri Lankesh, who was shot dead outside her house last evening. This is not the first time that a journalist has been attacked and killed in India. Hers was a journalism of dissent. Hers mm -hmm. was a journalism of courage. And obviously, she must have rubbed somebody the wrong way. And someone there, out there, decided to silence her forever. My mother called me up and saying, uh, she's fallen down. Uh, something's happened. Can you go and check? I immediately turned the car around and I was going and I don't know, I felt... Because she was an extreme stress and, you know, the kind of lifestyle she had, hardly eat, eats properly, sleeps late night, works till three in the night. So I thought maybe she fainted, blood pressure, something must have happened and... I don't know, some kind of fear was there with me, but... I almost reached her house one road away and I got a call from the television people, uh, media, and, said, uh, Madam, what happened? Do you know that Gauri has been shot? Uh, I think more than journalism also, along with that, she became an activist, a very rec uh, you know, forced to reckon with activists. From when uh, she passed away, I could make out there were streams of people from different strata of society, from uh, transgenders to farmers to um, young college students. So she, was, she had made a lot of influence on many, many people which I was quite surprised. I mean, I didn't know the kind of people who, who loved her and who came to see her, you know, so... Yeah, I mean... <laughs> For Gauri, journalism alone wasn't enough. Her activism was first ignited during the religious land dispute of the shrine Baba Budhankari in 2002. Then at that time, Karnataka, one important agitation going on was in Baba Budhankari. There is a very well-known Sufi shrine on the hillock. It had both Hindus, Muslims going there. The Hindutva, the Sangh Parivar, what we call it, the BJP's other wings, they started creating trouble there, saying it's a Hindu shrine abducted by the Muslims, so we have to retrieve it. We thought the shrine was a symbol of communal harmony, and these people are out there to destroy this harmony. And then onwards, Gauri started taking a liking towards the whole thing became a part of the GT. Gauri's outspoken activism against right-wing forces led her to many protests. During one of these protests, Gauri was arrested. After the BJP uh, and the JDS came to power over here, you've seen how uh, the state is very ruined by this. Uh, about two months ago in October, the coastal areas of Karnataka were up in flames, and even now, as we are in Delhi today, Mangalore is once again up in flames due to communal riots. <laughs> We make a distinction now between being a Hindu and Hindutva as an ideology. Hindutva means that I want to bring the hegemony of the upper caste so that it becomes the ruling character of Hindus. The nationalist Hindutva ideology equates the Indian nation to a Hindu nation. It is at odds with the original constitution of India, written by Bhim Rao Ramji Ambedkar, a voice for equality, who defined the country as a secular state. Look, in the beginning of India, this is not a secular state. 
अच्छा और इसलिए कि यह देश हिंदू तो कह ही रहा है जो है हमेशा धर्म सापेक्ष देश रहा है और हमारी आधारशिला जो है वह यही रही है धार्मिकता ही भारतीयता की एक आधारशिला रही है क्योंकि मुसलमानों के कारण यह जो है ये धर्मनिरपेक्ष बन गया है ये देश जो है धर्मनिरपेक्ष बन गया है जबकि ऐसा होना नहीं चाहिए कि बीजेपी जो का जो जो विकल्प है कि ये इसको हिंदू राष्ट्र के रूप में परिवर्तित किया जाए भारतीय जनता पार्टी की तरफ में और श्रीमान मोदी जी की तरफ में ये जनता का फैसला Under Mr Modi who served in the RSS before being assigned to the BJP ties have never been tighter Since 2014 the RSS has thrown its full organizational weight behind BJP campaigns In return Mr Modi has inserted RSS men or like-minded ones into every part of Indian politics Gauri's assassination became a big national issue It became an international issue It was referred to in the United Nations meeting Protest meetings were held in America, New Zealand, and Australia, besides many parts in India, but not a single word of condemnation came from the Prime Minister. Gauri had 18 defamation cases against her when she died. And you can't write nowadays. You're immediately filed with a defamation court case. But uh, in the 80 cases, Gauri had to travel to remote villages, sometimes small towns. The court cases would be there. But I think she took that opportunity to speak to people, to speak to youngsters, to mobilize people, like-minded people against right-wing extremism. You know. One speaks about Gauri Lankesh and what uh, people did to her, uh, her assassination. But what people do not talk about is what preceded her assassination, a disinformation campaign in Karnataka where she was branded as an anti-Hindu, someone who was against Hinduism. and that disinformation campaign sort of creates a conducive atmosphere where people can be simply eliminated so we rally behind gauri lankesh we rally behind rohit pemola but there is one complaint that i have we rally behind these people after after they have been institutionally murdered or after they have been murdered we need to rally behind people while they are alive to ghar mein mange always think back when i say did you have to speak like that so much or did you have to be so blatantly talking about uh, hindutva or anything she could have toned it down a bit how can i tell her to censor herself you know would you have been alive if you had not been so outspoken but at what cost gori was killed because she stood up for the marginalized she spoke up against fascist forces and believed in a secular india However she wasn't the only one who was silenced for being a voice of reason. Narendra Dabolkar, MM Kalburki and Govind Pansare all faced the same end. The three men were rationalists and intellectuals that were vocal critics of the Hindutva agenda. The Bolkar was shot dead near his home in 2013 and Pansare and Kalburki in 2015. The same gun was later used to shoot Gauri Lankesh outside her home in 2017. when gauri lankesh is murdered that's when you sit up and and take note of what is happening those threats are now traveling well beyond the margins those threats are now being felt by journalists in bangalore where gauri lankesh was murdered as much in delhi where last year we had perhaps half a dozen protests in the press club journalists getting together once marching on the streets overall in the country they create an atmosphere in which journalists are afraid to say and write what they should be saying or writing risk aversion is the preferred path uh, why rock the boat why ask difficult questions why annoy uh, narendra modi or arun jetli or amit shah if you don't have to do it you see the dogmatists can't tolerate dissent but there is a concerted effort through these very informal channels and these very sort of indirect insidious ways to either control journalists muzzle journalists or 
In the end, get the journalist services terminated from the organization. The media in India has never been more obedient to corporate and political forces as it is today. The freedom of journalists to objectively report is ceasing to exist, with governments and legal systems failing to protect or rescue them. Today, prominent Indian politicians and corporate entities are making increasingly underhanded investments in news media, and the press is failing to serve as a potent unbiased tool to inform public perception. India's biggest TV network, CNN IBN, is directly controlled by one of the world's richest business tycoons, Mukesh Ambani. 2014, Mr. Modi won, and Mr. Ambani, who was, uh, had always been a kind of benevolent investor in our channel, which was CNN IBN, suddenly after Modi's victory decided he would take over. Rajiv and I were the senior journalists there, and we decided, listen, we can't be in a situation where a corporate is sitting in the newsroom. Uh, that can't happen. You know, that is a fundamental surrender of the journalist's freedom. All media in India other than the government media is privately owned, right? So the, the traditional model has been families. What we've seen over the last 10, 12 years is uh, corporate, in the sense that large companies getting involved. You can see the impact that has on editorial content. So there is a tension between the kind of corporate agenda, uh, which, is, which may be political at, at, at some super level, and the, uh, the idea that you're also running a business to make money. Uh, what has also happened that the media has started acting like a lynch mob. So this entire campaign about who's a national, who's not an, who's an anti-national, and basically profiling everyone on the left as an anti-national. There is no attempt to even question those in power. And that's a very dangerous trend. It's a dangerous trend for media in general, but more specifically, it's a dangerous trend for democracy. The biggest accusation against Republic TV is that it calls other people anti-national. Who are you to call yourself a nationalist? If you're working against national interest, then what you're doing is anti-national. I would say that in India, you know, the main purveyors of uh, fake news are basically um, the media. I have been described, for instance, on a leading channel, and I don't go to that channel. I wasn't present in the place. As a lawyer for the lashkar e toiba which is a terrorist organization, okay? This kind of thing has happened many times. It's worrying that um, channels that have the largest viewership uh, have have become the most compromised, uh, have been suborned to a large extent. Uh, Ravish coined the term Godi media, essentially embedded media. You know, it's one thing to have media that's not critical and that doesn't ask questions or that's tame. And today when I watch Times Now or Republic TV, night after night, vilifying Muslims, trying to paint Muslims as backward, obscurantist, anti-Hindu. You know, they're trying to create a siege mentality among Hindus that somehow being Hindu is a sin. If we can't be Hindus in India, where can we be Hindus, etc., etc. You know, they pick up issues on an almost nightly basis and use that to promote distrust, division, polarization, hatred. And, you know, it worries me. For us to save the space to debate differences in future, we need to save the democratic space that is under threat today, which is what the RSS uh, is the danger. And uh, one can look at universities, for example, where this difference is playing out, a few universities where this difference is playing out. Uh, but these universities, the very future of these universities is at stake. So why not ally it together to fight them? Higher education in India is something that over time has become accessible to most stratas of society. But the caste system is still prevalent. Dalits, historically considered the lowest caste, have faced the brunt of religious fundamentalism, with their right to higher education consistently questioned by right-wing Hindu forces. The suicide of Rohit Vemala, a PhD student at University of Hyderabad has brought attention to the discrimination Dalits are increasingly facing. The question is that the Hyderabad Kendri Vishwiddhalaya ke Dalit Chhatra Rohit Vimula has been happy with it. Why? We are talking about Hyderabad University of Dalit Chhatra. It is necessary that we know what happened before. What was the first thing that happened before? Students and faculty from over 30 different uh, colleges, universities, uh, from across the country, activists as well, who came here to show their support and solidarity for the Justice for Rohit movement. Dalit as an identity is, is an identity which in the eyes of the other, it becomes an identity of being polluted or, or someone who's coming from a lower caste of this society. Rohit, I knew him uh, from Ambedkar Students Association. We also were part of several you know, protests and all. And at the end, uh, we also, five of us were socially boycotted from campus places and hostels. 
फॉर नो रीजन अंबेडकर स्टूडेंट्स एसोसिएशन के छात्र नकुल सिंह साहनी की एक फिल्म है मुजफ्फरनगर बाकी है के दिखाए जाने का समर्थन कर रहे थे फिल्म दिखाने के समर्थन में अंबेडकर स्टूडेंट्स एसोसिएशन के छात्रों ने हैदराबाद यूनिवर्सिटी में विरोध प्रदर्शन किया इस कारण एबीवीपी के नेता वहां के फेसबुक पर इन छात्रों को गुंडा लिख दिया उन्होंने hooliganism while the atrocious acts that have been committed by caste hindus on dalits since since centuries have been quietly ignored outside the university also there was a complaint that was lodged against us uh, against uh, me rohit against uh, vijay seshu sunkarna and others complaint has been lodged in the kachipoli police station and we went we were detained there for about 8 to 9 hours also विश्वविद्यालय की सर्वोच्च कार्यकारी समिति ने अपने स्तर पर फैसला दे दिया और ये पांच छात्र हॉस्टल से निलंबित कर दिए गए और इनकी फेलोशिप रोक दी गई द फाइव स्टूडेंट्स रिटर्न टू द यूनिवर्सिटी टू फाइंड देयर रूम डोर्स डबल लॉक्ड दे हैड बीन सोशली बॉयकॉटेड फ्रॉम कैंपस फॉर नो रीजन रोहित एंड हिज फ्रेंड्स कैंप्ड आउट इन प्रोटेस्ट रोहित रोट मेनी लेटर्स टू द एडमिनिस्ट्रेशन ऑल ऑफ दीस वेन अननोटिस्ड एंड अनआंसर्ड This eventually led to his final letter. Please supply a nice rope to the rooms of all Dalit students from your companion, the great chief warden. As we, the scholars, PhD students, have already passed that stage and are already members of the Dalit self-respect movement. Unfortunately, we here are left with no easy exit. Hence, I request your highness to make preparations for the facility of euthanasia. for students like me and i wish you and the campus rest in peace forever thanking you yours sincerely vr chakravedi when we talk about the university university's job is to critique the existing ideologies existing systems and knowledge cannot be created without open atmosphere without discussions debate so when you don't allow other views no you can't create knowledge then what is a university university is not buildings in that sense we have to protect the universities otherwise even society will die they also don't want serious social science subjects they why you need history because they will tell what is history why you need subjects here <laughs> so therefore they are also saying we don't need history we don't need economics proper if you want economics you do business economics which is useful to corporate and private or which is useful to hindu fundamentals astrology and priesthood somebody say cow science some of these subjects they want to bring and introduce and remove some of these subjects they appointed vice chancellors who belong to their ideology now the chancellor of this university is a rss person and even registrar so they want to control everything in the uh, administration not only are the bjp appointing rss members into university administrations they are also rewriting the historical narrative of india one way they are doing this is by appropriating important figures in history books for example painting bhim rao ambedkar who is fundamentally against RSS ideologies as a sympathizer of right wing nationalism jinhone mahabharat padha hai ya suna hai unko main mahabharat ki taraf le jana chahta hu aur meri jo choti si samajh hai uske hisab se mujhe lagta hai ki karna ka jo janm hua tha wo stem cell ka science tha technology thi One example of religious propaganda in education is the addition of the text The Laws of Manu in most national university syllabuses. This text justifies the caste system as being created by God. If it is something done by human beings we can say that we can change. But if you say this entire caste system is from God there is no way to change it even if it is worse even if it is atrocious. So, so like that it has given a divine sanction. 
every time a project of saffron migration comes it is these independent voices that used to voice out against these projects of saturnization these projects of brahmanical culture that has been specifically propagated they thought rohit's voice could be suppressed and he was led to be institutionally murdered but the voice that he gave through his final letter started the fight that's still going on in the name of justice for rohit vemela in the name of the politics of ambedkarite organizations this fight is what keeps his voice alive the extremist mindset of modi's government has made itself felt all over the world during modi's visit to london in 2018 people were driven to the streets in protest their anger was triggered by the horrific rape and murder of 8-year-old Asif Abano a nomadic muslim girl from the state of Jammu and Kashmir a special investigating team probing the rape and murder of an 8-year-old nomad girl in Kathua in Jammu and Kashmir has be, has arrested a policeman for that gruesome crime eight hindu men um abducted her held her captive gang raped her and then murdered her I came to know about the seriousness of the case. I saw the political leaders supporting the accused person. As an activist lawyer, I thought it is very important to help the victims. They were met with protests from Hindu nationalists who rose to the defense of the accused apparently only because of their religion. The Jammu Bar Association had been under severe criticism for supporting protests against the rape accused. The lawyers at Katua they did not allow the crime branch to produce the chalan they physically stopped that if some crime takes place in the society the duty of a lawyer is to practice law in the court a lawyer should not come on the road we became out in streets here in jammu region and started talking about defending the people who been accused of the rape and the killing they called themselves the hindu ekta manch so you know giving themselves that name in itself shows the kind of polarization that is the tricolor was used so i feel it is humiliating and abusing our tricolor a true nationalist would never do it a rape has happened and you're defending the accused by wrapping yourself in the national flag and saying this is nationalist sorry that's not my definition of nationalist but the fact that you one has started looking at these issues from the hindu muslim angle this is reflective of the kind of polarization which has happened over the last 4 years are musliman kitne jo hai wo hain 24% ya 25% hain inke dar se to hum bahut kuch jo hai wo chhod gaye apni cheezon ko ab unki kya avashyakta hai is desh mein jo hai wo kapane pachane ki my concern is being a citizen of this country that if something wrong is taking place why our prime minister doesn't speak and the accused they are being garlanded their securities are being enhanced and then it takes away my confidence from my prime minister because he is my prime minister also he is not prime minister of hindus he is prime minister of a sikh also he is a prime minister of a christian also he is a prime minister of a muslim also but he doesn't speak my language He doesn't speak for me. My nation constitutes of everyone. My nation doesn't constitute of Hindus only. We all are living together. So it is my responsibility, my duty, to work as a lawyer activist, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, for everyone. The way the sport and all was going to accused, we thought, no, we need to be there with the uh, the victims. The right-wing Hindu nationalist refused Asifa's nomadic Muslim community a local burial because of who they were. They had to walk 7 miles to another village to bury her body. They are in pain. They have lost their child. So now they're trying to recover. I don't think they'll be able to recover, but they're trying to. They also have huge faith that justice will be delivered. <laughs> The communal mindset surrounding Asif's case asks a greater question about nationalism. Gori, Rohit and Asif's cases show us how the three independent pillars of democracy 
have quietly been compromised. What does this mean for the future of India? Thinking of India as a country where one religion or one language or one gender or one sexuality dominates and others have no rights or others have rights or the tolerance of the majority is something that is fundamentally antithetical to the idea of a nation. If you're going to tell people that we will kill you for what you eat, or we will kill you for the fact that you fell in love, or we will kill you for what you think or what you read or what you write, we might come to your door and shoot you dead because of uh, you know, your views. We will then celebrate your death on social media. What is it? It's a form of terror. Indian nationalism was not based on caste or class or religion or color of skin or ethnicity. It was plural, all welcoming nationalism based on a liberal democracy as enshrined in the constitution. It's just that right-wing propaganda lacks nuance to such like basic level. You can't just nation, this guy's question, anti-national. Nationalism is not to lynch someone. Nationalism is not to rape someone. Nationalism is not to go in support of rapists. That is not nationalism at all, right? Nationalism is to protect. Nationalism is to, you know, maintain communal harmony. A nation is made up of its people and one has to stand up for people's rights. This ideology of nationalism wants you to be blind to the reality of the condition of the people in the country today. If you are simply going to talk about nationalism and not about the people inhabiting the nation, we'll have a nation without people. That's a very dystopic future we are staring at.